Connesty, how are you? Welcome to another episode of the Candle Tales podcast, episode 53. We're hurtling along. My name is Aaron Hegarty, and I am going to be listening to a story from my sister Surika. We're the co founders of Candle Tales. So if you like what we're doing, you can help us out. You can go online and share. You can like it. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, all of those things are good. You can also give us some monetary help as well by going to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. A big shout out and a huge thank you for everyone who has supported us up to this point already. Thank you. It means a lot. And if you want to get involved in the conversation we'll be having after this, it'll be seven o'clock Sunday evening, live streamed and then released after that in our next episode. But without further ado, it's time for Sorica to take it away. In Irish, the word for king is Ri, and the word for queen is Ban Rian. But you might better translate that word to woman king. Kruaka was the woman king of Connacht. The little is known of her. She built the fort that was named for her on the plain of Kruakon that was named also for her. And that place bears her name to this day. But she was eclipsed by her own daughter, fiery-haired, a warrior woman, and a daughter of kings and woman kings. Maeve's father was Oki Fideluk, the High King, and her mother was Kruaka, woman king of Connacht. But she was not their only child. There was a time when Kruaka's daughter, Clothru, was the one who ruled at Kruakon I in Connacht, her successor. But Clothru was strange. Strange in her attitudes, strange in her ways. She had dwelled in the other world, and she had eaten the fruit there. It is said that those who eat the fruit of the other world run mad, but Clothru did not. In fact, she was so far away from mad, that sometimes her decisions seemed altogether strange. And hers is a strange story, but a story for another time. Maeve was the most beautiful of the daughters of the king. Besides Clothru, there was Ethna of the Furzy Hair and Ella and the Mugan. But Maeve, with her long, beautiful face and her flaming red hair and her way of intoxicating men so that they felt drunk in her presence, she was the prize of all of them. And she knew this well, and she wore it with a smile that had a little bit of a swagger in it. Now at this time there was a new young king in Ulster, and Ochi Fideluk was a little worried about him. His name was Crohor Magnessa, and he had ascended to the kingship at a very young age, and he'd been given a great deal of help by his very wily mother, Nessa. He presided over the Red Branch Knights, the Crave Rua of Ulster, and Ochi Fideluk had a worry on him, that Crohor might turn his eyes south and decide to expand beyond Ulster's borders. As High King, it was his task and his duty to ensure balance on the island and so he decided to appease the proud young king by sending his most beautiful daughter and offering her hand in marriage to Grohor Magnessa. 
Maeve was very much in favour of this idea. Krahor was known to be a very handsome man. His beautiful legs must always be on display for their pleasure. But Maeve was less pleased with this arrangement when she met Krohor Magnessa and found him even more prideful than she was, arrogant and headstrong and controlling. For his part, Krohor Magnessa was proud to meet his new wife, this beautiful, intoxicating woman. But he soon found that his mood soured easily when she was around. He would see her talking with other men, making them laugh. Maeve had a way of lighting up every room that she was in. Every man's eye would go to her, and the smile on her lips every man would think was just for him and Krohor could not find it in him to appreciate this, because it stirred in his heart not pride in his wife, but jealousy and suspicion. And every time she let her gaze linger on one of the warriors of the Crave Rua, Krohor felt his heart twist in his breast. He told her she must not speak with other men alone, and Maeve agreed. But then at a feast he saw her laughing at the words of another warrior and after that feast in a cold fury he told her she must not speak to other men. And Maeve agreed. But she asked him how he expected her to be his queen when she could not speak to another man. Krohor had no answer. At the next feast in Awanmaka, he noticed how Maeve did not even need to speak to draw every man's eye to her, and how those lustful glances caressed her body, and how she batted her eyelashes back at the handsome men who gazed at her so. And he took her aside, in a rage and he demanded that she look at no man but he and Maeve daughter of the High King daughter of the Woman King of Connacht turned on her heel and walked out of Awanmaka never to return Noachi Fideluk found that his plans to appease the young king of Ulster lay in tatters. Both Maeve and Krohor too proud to abide together, and he could see that this disaster might cause ripples of trouble. And so he invited Krohor Magnassa to a feast in Tara, and offered him his other daughter's hand in marriage, Ethna of the Furzy Hair. Maeve did not attend the wedding feast. She had no desire to be in the same room as Krohor Magnessa again. She went roaming by herself, by the banks of the River Boyne, and swimming in its cold waters to quench the fury that still burned under her skin. At the wedding feast, Krohor looked at his new bride, the daughter of the High King, just as high-born as his previous bride, but more suitable. This one did not meet his gaze with eyes that flashed fiercely. This one looked aside when he glared. This one kept her focus on him as a wife should. This one had not the flaming hair of Maeve. Ethna's hair was furzy, 
and did not shine and blaze as Maeve's had. Ethna's soft eyes did not have the same fire as Maeve's. Ethna's pale face was not so long as Maeve's. Which was better? He was sure all of it was much better. She was a better woman and a better wife. But the longer he looked at her, the more he saw what she was not. She was not her sister. She was not Maeve. And when Crahor went out on a hunt, alone, on the morning after the wedding, he was not looking for Maeve. He was certain of that. Nevertheless, he found her. His rebel wife, who'd left him in all his pride and fury, bathing in the waters of the River Boyne. And when Crohor came up to her, her weapons were by the bank, her armour was by the bank, and he saw her there as defenceless as she would ever be before him. The daughter of kings and woman kings, alone because she had not gone to the wedding feast, unguarded, vulnerable. And he took his pride and his anger out on her, and he made her pay for humiliating him. And in the cold mud on the banks of the River Boyne, King Crohor Magnessa forced himself on Maeve, the daughter of kings and woman kings. And then he went back to Ulster with his new bride. Maeve took her hurt and her fury and used them to sharpen herself like a blade. She threw herself into her training. She had always favoured the spear and the shield over the sword. Now she learned to wield that long spear with a viciousness that matched any in Ireland. And when her rage blazed brightest, that spear would burst into flames and become a weapon nigh unstoppable. And when she felt she was good and ready, Maeve went west, to the place of her mother, to the seat of Cruachon I, where she was determined now to rule. The King of Connacht was a man named Tinny McConry at this time, and when Maeve, the daughter of the High King, came storming in one day, with her blazing hair and her long pale face and her eyes flashing at him, Tinny McConry did not know if he was terrified or in love or both. But he welcomed her with a great feast. Now, there was an annual tradition in certain parts of Ireland where all the women would have the opportunity to prove their worth to compete with one another to show which of them was the most potent. And this was a sacred ritual. In Ulster, they did this by melting the snow from the tops of standing stones in the winter time. In Connacht, they did this by digging a trench as deep as they could and Maeve was just in time for the annual competition. Certain that she would take the prize. Maeve waited. As each of the other women in Connacht took their turn to lift their skirts, squat down to the approved height, and see how deep a furrow they could dig in the ground with the force of their piss, and when it was her turn, Maeve squatted 
and let go, a stream. So forceful, so capacious, that it filled three lakes. And with that, the people of Connacht proclaimed that they had found their next king. And Tinny McConry was not much put out, because Maeve took him as a lover not long after that. But she told him that if he wanted to marry her, she had three conditions. Hard won and well learned. I will not marry a man who is less generous than I, she told the former king of Connacht. I will not marry a man who is less courageous than I. It would be a shame on me if my husband were to hide behind my skirts when a battle was begun. And I will not marry any man with any shred of jealousy in him. For I will have as many lovers as I like. And my husband must abide by that. Tinny McConry agreed to all of her conditions and would have agreed to any more. But that was enough for Maeve. However, when Tinny McConry asked his wife about her former husband and saw the pain in her eyes, he determined to avenge the dishonour done to her. Maeve told him not to. That vengeance was hers and she would take it in her own good time. But Tinny McConry ignored her and he rushed off to Ulster and he challenged Grhor Magnessa to single combat. And Grhor Magnessa, King of Ulster, the province of war, he fought Tinny McConry in single combat and he took his life. Maeve did not want for company in Connacht. As a woman king, she was generous and open-handed and her people loved her dearly. She had great wealth and great hospitality and she set up a building up Cruachan Eye to being a feasting hall to rival any in the country, to be a place of hospitality that was lauded by bards and poets, and the nobles of Connacht adored her. And kings and sons of kings came to court her, but all of them had to hear her three conditions for marriage. She would not marry a man who was not as brave as she, and as generous as she, and she would not marry any man with jealousy in his heart. And none of them found themselves equal to all of those conditions. Still, Maeve had no hesitation in entertaining a man for a night, or a few. And indeed, Maeve thoroughly enjoyed herself with all these suitors. It was said that Maeve never had a man without another man waiting outside, and it took seven men in one day to keep her happy. It was around this time that she decided to marry Yuki Dola. Yuki Dola, who agreed to all of her conditions, and who seemed a fine enough consort to the woman king of Connacht. Rokidola began to nurse a secret jealousy in his heart, in spite of his promise to Maeve. And this jealousy was for a young captain of her bodyguard, a handsome man with golden hair, tall and proud and beautiful. And he and Maeve seemed to spend all their time together. And Okidola knew Maeve was very conscious of status. And he knew as well as she did that this man was the son of the King of Leinster. And one of his brothers was in the running to be the High King of All Ireland. 
and so he nursed his jealousy for all ill Makmota. Until the day came when Okidala could bear it no longer, and he challenged Oliel to single combat. Now Oliel looked at Maeve across the battlefield, and Maeve looked back at Oliel, and she gave him the slightest of nods, because Okidala had betrayed to her that greatest flaw, that flaw she could not tolerate in a man. He had shown his jealousy, his possessiveness over her, and she would not be married to a man like that again. And the bright, beautiful warrior Oliel Magmotha struck down Okidola, and Maeve took him as her consort. And Oliel Magmotha was her equal in almost every way. He did not give in to jealousy. He was brave and he was generous. And they had seven sons together and a daughter, Finever. She took in the refugees of foreign wars, those fleeing the oppression of the Romans in Britain, came to Connacht for shelter and were granted it. Exiles came to her and were welcomed in. Her cruel con eye was a place of welcoming, a place of plenty, perched perilously at the brink of the other world, for the hill of Krukon itself would open up from time to time and spit out creatures from the other world, some wonderful and some terrible and monstrous. Most rulers would not be able to abide this. But Maeve understood her mother's wisdom in building the seat of power where she had, and she knew how to keep this world and the other world in balance. And so she did. She had no terror of the creatures of the mound. She called them out herself from time to time, cat-like beings, and sometimes they would even do her bidding. And so Kruokonai was a place of magic too, and mystery, and harmony with the strangeness of the other world. And under the stewardship of Maeve and Oliel, the woman king and her consort, Connacht prospered, their herds grew and multiplied, and the province became wealthy as well as wise. But Maeve never forgave Crohor Magnessa for his insults to her. One day she asked a druid which of her sons would kill Crohor, for she was certain it would be one of them. And the druid replied, Manya. And so without hesitation, Maeve renamed all seven of her sons Manya, against the day that one of them might kill Krohor Magnessa. She never missed an opportunity to go against the Ulster King. She never missed a chance to raid Ulster's borders. She had her warriors harry his lands constantly. And as the deaths piled up on either side, the rivalry and the bitterness grew to a pitch. The woman king bided her time and waited for the day when she could destroy Krohor Magnassa once and for all. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Woman King. Well, there you go. It's quite a harrowing story, but fair play to my sister Sorica for piecing this together we wanted to shine a light on a more full and a more rounded story of Queen Maeve that she doesn't always get I think so it sets us up to be looking into the dark half of the year and the stories of the tawn that we often often get to and that will be coming closer to Samhain I guess a few more stories in the pipeline until then and 
we are, as always, going to credit the people who work on this podcast. This podcast was produced and edited by Oshin Ryan. The music was by Oshin Ryan with help so, with a little bit of help so, from Rue O'Shea. Look at that, got tongue tied. Thank you for all of those who have helped us with Candlelit kind of Tales. There are too many of you to mention all in one go, but we wouldn't be here without your support. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you would like to support this podcast, you can do by sharing it with friends, telling people about it, trying to tell that story again and mentioning our name afterwards. You can follow us on your preferred social media using hashtag Candlelit Tales podcast. You can support us directly, of course, by going to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales. Anything you might spare, you can throw us our way. Or you can even do a once off donation if you don't want to be tied to a monthly thing by going to candlelittales.ie and following the PayPal link there. We'd love for you to get in touch with any questions or comments, story suggestions. You can get in touch from Instagram or Facebook, direct messages or info at candlelittales.ie. Find out more about our wit, our workshops and what's going on on candletales.ie. If we have any live shows, we tend to put it up on social media as well. So if you'd like to book a live show just for your very own, well, you can get in contact at bookings, sorry, bookings at candletales.ie. That is all for now. We'll have one more King's story before we wrap up this whole thing and we'll be entering into some sound stories very soon. As always, we'll be talking about this story on Sunday evening at 7 o'clock Irish time. So do tune in and follow the link from Facebook or Instagram. It'll be a YouTube link and we'll be going live there to talk about the woman king in more detail and how we constructed it, the ideas around it and yeah, the psychology behind it. It's a lot to talk about and do get in touch if you have any comments or questions of your own. Thank you very much. That's all from us. Hope you're keeping well, keeping safe, keeping sound, and keeping our candle lit. You. Take this child away. Kill her. Slit her throat. Or drown her if you must. Throw her into the depths of the sea. Just... Take her away. King Oki's orders hung heavy in the air as three men stood looking at him and then they looked at the sleeping innocent child.